Hi, this is Ron Carter in New York. You are listening to John Liebman and this program for bass players only. Stick around and watch guys ask for what is the right note. Hello and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created ForBassPlayersOnly.com for people mostly over 50 who want to learn to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, this is the place to learn bass. What can I say about my guest today? He's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most recorded jazz bassist in history. He's made well over 2,000 recordings, and he says he meant every note he played. He's a Grammy Award-winning artist and a longtime personal hero of mine, the maestro Ron Carter. Welcome, Mr. Carter. It's good to have you back. John, how are you this rainy day, wherever you are? <laughs> I'm in Michigan and I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Speaking of Michigan, you grew up in Ferndale, Michigan. Yes. I grew up in Southfield, Michigan. I used to go see you play at Baker's Keyboard Lounge in Detroit. So you there with Tommy Flanagan, Billy Higgins. And uh, one real quick story. When I was a freshman at the University of Michigan, <clears throat> I got tickets for the Michigan-Michigan State football game. And I was really excited about that. And then I learned that you were scheduled to perform on that same date at the Royal Oak Music Theater with Sonny Rollins, McCoy Tyner, and Al Foster, Milestone Jazz Stars. Yes. And they were both on the same day, so I could either go to one or the other. I had to choose. And I thought it over for about two seconds, and I said, this is not a decision. This is a no-brainer. I gave the football tickets to my sister, headed over to the Royal Oak Music Theater with my best friend, Avery Bum, I'm sure you're watching. And it was a tremendous show. Now, about a month ago, my wife and I were looking for something. We're down in the basement. I opened up a box. And lo and behold, what's inside that box? The program oh, from, wow. that, from that show that I said, how often do you go to a jazz concert and get a program? So it was uh, October 14th, 1978. You remember what you played that night? No, but I played the best I could. <laughs> <laughs> you played great. I still remember. It's great to see that you're still so active, playing, touring, performing. Tell me what's keeping you busy these days. Uh, well, you know, as you know by reading some occasional little blip on what I do, I'm making it a career of trying to find the best notes. And I can't do that at home doing like this. I, I got to be on the gig. So uh, right now, I just finished uh, four nights at the uh, Blue Note with uh, my quartet, but Irene Rosness on piano, Jimmy Green saxophone, and Peyton Crossley drums. And we had a great reunion after being this, what they call the long intermission uh, that we went through almost three years. And we worked like everybody else, uh, not, not nearly, nearly enough. So. It's a nice four-day greeting from my dear friends, and we had a great, great house. And uh, I'm trying to ease my way into those working situations again. Uh, travel is such, such, such a hassle now, and it's so difficult to get from one place to another physically convenient and, 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 and save time. It just limited some of the things I've done because I just couldn't get there physically comfortable enough for me, you know. Uh, I'm also writing some books, my little publication company, Retract Productions, Inc. And uh, my latest book is called uh, Ron Carter Drops, which is the little figures you play when you go on diggity boom. I have a book analyzing how those things happen, when, maybe, when, when it may be best to do them, and when to know when to stop. So, so I'm, I'm kind of getting busy again after having two and a half years with little to do with anything at all. I like how you refer to that as an intermission. That's a nice way, a nice positive way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah, can we do? Well, finding the right notes, the, the name of uh, of your biography, also the name of that outstanding documentary. I want to ask you. you about that because you've, you've shown that there's, there's definitely some freedom and finding the right notes, yet at the same time, there's a framework that we have to stay within. 
as bass players, we pretty much have to play the root of the chord on the downbeat when that chord is first introduced, most of the time anyway. It could be argued that that's 25% of our job right there as bass players. So how do you balance those two roles without getting into trouble? Well, I'm not so committed to having to play the root on the downbeat of any measure. You know, I think uh, you got four beats in that measure and you know how many beats there are per chord that measure. That's the number of choices you have. Uh, it need not have to be a, a root to be legitimate. Uh, you know, when I get this question from uh, at clinics and uh, base, base chats, chats we have sometimes, I explain to them that if you want a lot of roots, you have to go come to my house on Saturday and go three blocks to the farmer's market. They have a lot of roots there, man. You know, a lot of different kinds of that, and they're great roots. You know? <laughs> I like roots. But I like to thank John that I built my line to where the root is supposed to be acceptable that my choice of a non-root note is not only more acceptable, but more challenging to the note that follows that non-root note. Uh, so I'm not so, again, I, I play roots. That's the heart of the beginning of every chord. It starts with a root. But there's nothing to say that a root can't start on the second beat and some other non-chord note on the first beat. You know, and we play them we do these non-root things because of the, the thought process and the concept of the line. And what these guys are playing behind you, they give room to make that downbeat not need to be a root, depending on how they're voicing their chords, how aggressively, harmonically their instrument is, how much, how much of your attention they're grasping as you're building these lines. You know, My general thought, John, is that when a person keeps saying, hey, man, play some roots, I kind of feel that they can only play their solo if there's a root making that work. That's it. They're asking me to dumbfound, to, to downplay my ability, my interest, my concept of a bass line, and the line I'm building for their entire solo for the entire evening. And if I have their attention, they understand that they're, 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 they're including my information in the piano harmony, the drum beat, the other horn, the arrangement, that my note that I play individually and collectively for the whole night is as important as a piano voicing or a drum downbeat. So uh, while I tease everyone that you want some roots, go to the farmer's market, I'm not opposed to playing them. But they shouldn't be opposed to playing them without hearing them understand the value of that note that's not a root note based on those notes that surround that note. Okay, I hear what you're saying. It just, to me, sounds like very dangerous territory that you better really know what you're doing. Cause, John, cause the, John, the play, John, John, wait a minute. Playing a root in the wrong place, that's, that's, that's disheartening. People think the root is always the beginning of the top of the tune, for example, or the beginning of the bridge. And the guy who plays roots, that may not be in the right place for the root because that's not, in fact, the assumed downbeat at the beginning of the chorus or beginning of the last eight. Yeah. And when you play a blues in F, why can't the first note be A? Because we agree we're in the root in the key of F. Or why can't the first note be a B natural going to C for the second beat? Then the third beat F for the root, and another octave low, another octave lower, another root. That's two rows per measure. What does the guy want? Or gal. Sorry ladies. <laughs> Uh, okay, I still think you really need to to know what you're doing. There's a certain expectation that the other band members and maybe even the audience have of the bass player. So I I hear what you're saying and I I I get it. I have a little hard. I, I you know trying to get my head around it. You make total sense, but I still think that uh, one would have to proceed with caution. That's just my <laughs> my reaction. John, it's the same thing with playing the roots. You have to use the root with caution. And I'm, I'm great at that. I'm equally great uh, at, at making that attempt to be great at playing a non root for the downbeat. And I think I'm asking the musicians in this band, I'm asking them to understand there's another source of information for them. Unless they're willing to accept my information as best, being as valid as theirs. And I'm interested in developing a baseline, not just the beat of the band. 
then uh, we have to sign and have a discussion about uh, not whose interest is the most paramount, but sharing the talent in the band and get the most out of the talent in the band. If you ask me to play Roots all night, you're limiting my choice of notes and you're limiting my ability to make a line that's the story of the tune. You know, and, and I, I don't think that people who insist on the roots are really trying to do that. They just kind of been involved in an environment where either the bass player didn't know how not to play the root and make it important, or their solo is so dependent on the first note being a one or the chord, a root, to let him know where he is in his solo. I'm okay. I'm, I, I'm open to discussion. And so far, no one has convinced me that a root is a bad note. <laughs> Love it. It opens up a whole new way of thinking. Yes, John, that's my job, man. Come on. Well, let, let's let's take that a step further. When you were playing with Miles Davis, okay, yes. I always understood Miles as choosing his bandmates for what they can contribute to the sound. But he must have known what he wanted, but he also allowed everyone the freedom to express themselves. And you've said Miles trusted your judgment. Yes. And you comment on that given your experience with him? I worked with him for five and a half years. It's a lot of concerts, a lot of records, only two rehearsals. And not once did he say, hey, Ron, don't play that note. I never heard that. Not in all those gigs. John, I have, I have a book out, speaking of publications, called uh, Chartography. And in this book, I've taken the, the nerve and liberty to analyze what I played behind Miles Davis's band on the song Autumn Leaves. And in this book, I've taken, with a lot of help from my transcribing friends and, and writers of text, Autumn Leaves for the first three or four courses for five different concerts over a period of time. Yeah. It's a great laboratory. And if the person really wants to know how, how what, what liberty, I don't call it freedom, the liberty I had with making a line of my choice and letting that line evolve for a period of time, they should buy that. And they will look, how many times do I play the root? How many times do I play a, a, a same rhythm? How I develop a line for, in this limited example of four or five courses of autumn leaves, played for six different, five concerts with Herbie, Tony, Wayne, whoever, the, George, Coleman, to see how my note choices, and how they develop over the course of the five concerts, and more importantly, how the band responds to my information. And when they see this, my, my, concept, my, 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 uh, my concept, my direction, my insistence, that I have their attention like I'm giving them mine, they have a better understanding of what my goal is, or one that I too have ideas. If they want to share what I do, give me a part of that attention that they hold it back for the TV show or for the cartoon, car, whatever they do. I don't know that. Eh? It's called chartography. You have described the role of the bass player as being like the quarterback of the band. Yes. I like very much. For bass players only is a bass instruction site. About 91% of my audience is male. Most of the people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They're not career bound. They just want to play maybe some classic rock riffs with their buddies or some blues shuffles, maybe some walking bass, a little funk R&B. What advice can you impart to those people who want to play bass? What do you think they should be thinking about? Uh, get a teacher who will show you at least a basic way to find the notes that you think you hear that work. You know, it's, it's difficult, but music's been so complicated, man. And you have so many variety of groups that are available looking for a bass player. You need to know something other than, I'm playing what I feel. That's not enough. Not that it's ever been, but right now it's even more not enough. You know, you have all, all these uh, uh, vamp behind, behind hip hop records, all these guys who have these small labels that they record their own songs that they sell at gigs. You know, all these gigs in New York, they're a lot of popping up in New York at the, uh, these small uh, places in, in, in the hotel lounge. You know, a guy from school will call a buddy and I, I got this gig done at the pizza parlor. All these avenues of interest are available to them, 
not one specific genre of music. And I think to have a good start on making that genre will work is kind of have a better idea on what your instrument does and where to find the notes that fit this rock groove or this reggae background. You know, you got to know where to find those notes, John. And you can't find those notes with any kind of regularity and have God waiting for you to find where's F, man? It's that fucking root again. <laughs> Where is F of the downbeat, man? Where, where? So he, he moves his hand, he moves your hand for you, keep playing until he says, that's it, that's it. Come on. <laughs> no adult wants to hear that kind of stuff. He wants to know where it is. Well, a teacher makes that much more enjoyable and the knowledge is much more longer lasting on the different keys, different speeds, different changes, different groups need, need that information from you. S secondly, get, get, get a good instrument. Just because you're not playing it full time, uh, you're missing the chance of having the, a good feel what a good sound sounds like. When you get a good sound, John, that's half the battle because you can hear exactly what's wrong. And with the other ear, fix what's right. You know? and, and the third thing is uh, in, enjoy, in, enjoy what someone else does who's also your age group. There's a lot of competitive spirit and spirit in those groups where the oldest guy's a bass player. You know? The fun of it is, is watching these guys do something that makes you want to do something else at, at your limited range and at your limited experience. You know? Uh, and just 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 look and say, man, how did the guy do that? Can I do that? Was it, wow, look, there's no choice. Look, look, he plays a tune. He's got a wonderful sound. How do I get all these things? Because he's just so great at it. Yeah. Get a teacher, get a good base, understand that there's a way to get better with these two things in place. It goes for all ages, not just an older guy or gal, you know? What's the first thing you think about when you go to a gig or a recording session? Or you play uh, your first note? Uh, depending on how I get it, if it's a, a, a I'm tracking the line from record, and have I had the music in time to hear what, it's, what it sounds like? What's, what's, the, what's the totality of the track, not just my line? What's my line going to fit over? You know. Secondly, uh, do I know the engineer in the studio who trusts me when, I, when he asks me where to put the bass mic? That I know where I think it goes for my specific location of the bass. You know? uh, and the engineer has to be open for my suggestions. Because I'm the guy who's putting something in the microphone. Yeah. The first they ask you, I'll EQ it for you. No, 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 no. I got these. Yeah. This makes it work. You know? uh, I look for how, how, how big is the room? You know, the bass, John, as you have already noticed, tries to feel the sound of the environment. You got a big room, the bass goes, it tries to feel all of that sound. So the sound sounds a lot thinner in certain parts of the room because the sound is starting to gay as you play this note. If you're in a small booth with, 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 with barriers, the sound is more focused because it doesn't go so far from the microphone. It doesn't go so far from you. And, and the fourth thing I look for, John, is, a, is it a walk-up? And I'm not doing those walk-ups anymore. <laughs> I'm not walking up four flights of stairs to get to the, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Do you always use a microphone or use a pickup, like when you perform live, maybe? Um, it depends on where I'm playing and how, what kind of gear they have. You know, one of the problems, John, is that you have a six-night gig. The salmon is there for the first set, the first night, and you see him again on the next gig. And, and uh, no one tells those guys that the room sound changes for the second set. And you can, if you're going to do a sound guy with a reputable reputation, you got to be the guy who helps maintain that sound of the second set despite the environment changes. You have fewer people, you have more people. Right now, the air condition is on full force for an emissions to keep the air clean and all that stuff. And the sound from the second set, man, is not the same. It can't be. The bass feels different. The bass has been in this air conditioned tunnel for 45, 50 minutes. The bass has gotten cold, the lights are down. And the strings have all changed in pitch because the bass is, is doing like this. The body is going conducting and expanding. 
so the second set is always uh, feels different because it is in fact different. Yeah. What kind of pickup do you use when you do use a pickup? Uh, David Gage, the name escapes me right now, but it's, it's the best one on the market for me. The realist? Yes. Okay. And I, I love how you, you, you we, I, I like how you brought up the, the sound of the bass. And when you play those long, low notes, it, you can tell it's Ron Carter, especially when you use that low C extension that I've always loved. Right. What kind of strings do you use? Labella 7700s. Those mm -hmm. are a nylon rod with a silk wrap and a steel core. You use lapel strings. Yeah, I've been using them since uh, about 30 years or so. They're good for bowing too, right? They're a little more difficult because it's a, it's a, a silk, it's just a, a nylon wrapping. It's not as uh, friendly as a, a steel core or a gut string. But you, what you have to do is find which bow hair combination you want the black hair, white hair, nylon hair, what kind of rosin you're going to use. But once you find that combination for your base and those strings, it's out of sight, man. A combination of hair for the bow. I never thought of that. I always oh, thought yeah. it was white hair or black hair. No, what was that? The, the bleached one of them, the, 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 the hair of the, the a strand of hair has these things on them. And, and when the hair is bleached, it, that's kind of wiped off. So the surface is much more smooth and much more difficult to grab the string. And there are four or five different kinds of really great rosin can make this difference in hair on the string, hair on the bow on the string, a lot more bow friendly. So you have to bet that it's not very, it's called maybe 50 bucks, you can buy two or three kinds of rosin and find the best kind of rosin for your bow and your string. What kind of rosin do you like? John Beale, my friend in New York, makes the kind, and it's great for me. Uh, would you ever play much electric bass? Not anymore. Uh, I gave mine to my son about 40 years ago. Uh, and I, I, I have some great friends who always amaze me with their skill level and how they do this stuff night in and night out. I mean, just Victor Wooden and Steve Bailey, you know, uh, Nathan East, those guys are, are just, Jerry Jamont, it's amazing, amazing players, you know, and they're getting better whenever I hear them or see them, you know. Great musicians, great players, and they have good instruments. Uh, like I said, it's great to see you out and touring and performing and so active. What about the future? What else would you like to do that you haven't already done? Um, write book two of my bio. It will be more personal stories than career line stories. Uh, I hope that one day I just kind of go back to playing cello, cello as seriously at my later age as I was. At my younger age, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I want to get back to that right now. I just don't have enough time to do that kind of really intensive practicing again. You, you did that at Cass Tech High School, right? Yep, 1955. Lovely school. We had a great time. What about going from a, an instrument tuned in fifths to the bass tuned in fourths? Did that blow your mind or did. <laughs> no. I've got the same notes, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, Red Mitchell, obviously, and, and I met the, uh, the principal bass player for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Joel. Okay. He tunes his bass in fifths. I, I don't get it. but Yeah, well, I, 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 used to, I used to tease Red that he did that so guys wouldn't want to sit in on his bass. Right. <laughs> and he would tell me to get out of here. <laughs> what would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music? A scientist. Really? I love to experiment with things. I'm doing it with bass every night. I'm experimenting with strings. I'm experimenting with sound pulse movements. I'm experimenting with bass string heights from the fingerboard. I'm experimenting with curvatures of the bridge. I'm, I'm experimenting with a, developing a kind of bass line for this particular sax saxophone player or different kind of locations for the, the vamp that I got to play all night on the bass. I'm a scientist at heart and a bass player by uh, default. That's funny because in the documentary, Finding the Right Notes, you used that metaphor. You said Miles Davis was like a chemist in a white lab coat with all the chemicals and he let, let it, you know, left it to us to mix up the chemicals with the right combinations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he, he appreciated the mistakes we made because the guy's next explosion anyway. 
<laughs> so funny. Well, this is this is such an honor. We did an interview back in 2010. In the early days, I used to email questions and people would email them back. We didn't have Zoom back then. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for all the notes and for everything else. And we look forward to seeing and hearing lots more from you in the future. Thank you. Well, I've enjoyed really hearing your your cast, your, your broadcast is that how you get the different opinions from different bass players who have the same notes, different processes. I, 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 I am, that's the scientist in me. How can their fruit taste so different to so many, so many people? And a lot of those guys who, who, who have a process of learning songs and picking instruments out and approaching gigs, that fascinates me, you know? And, and the, your, your column presentation of all these choices, it's amazing to me. Congratulations for keeping me amazed all these years. Wow, that is quite a compliment. Thank you so much. That's a great note to end on. We found the right note today. Yes, singular. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Folks, you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. Remember, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com. For people, my people happen to be mostly over 50, but anybody who wants to learn bass, because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music and always trying to find the right notes. <laughs> for BassPlayersOnly.com, this is the place to learn bass. Thank you again to our very, very special guest, the maestro, Ron Carter. I will see you all next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, let's play bass. <laughs>